Hello, can you hear me? Hello and welcome to a new podcast, giving voice to the diverse talent working to improve health and care for people in West Yorkshire and Harrogate, presented by a Black, Asian, Minority Ethnic Staff Network. In this episode, Delphine Arinze from the Leeds Teaching Hospitals NHS Trust talks with Udi Achibong, Professor of Diversity at the University of Bradford. They're joined by Kez Hyatt from Bradford Teaching Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust and Syed Ahmed from Leeds and York Partnership NHS Foundation Trust. Conversation in this episode was centred around the experiences of being black or Asian in the workforce. talents in this room right now and I just wondered uh, I think Kes could answer this for me uh, so from your experience have you ever felt as though you've needed to prove yourself to work harder than your white peers or colleagues I think that's a really interesting um, question um, actually and I, I'd like to flip it because I believe you know, when the, the whole notion of diversity and when we talk about bringing our whole selves to work. And I think there's something so fantastic about diversity and diverse teams. So to give my own example, you know, I'm, I feel I'm, as though I'm very values driven and some of them values have come from my parents nice. who were very hard working. For example, my father worked in this country for 45 years. His work ethic was amazing. I remember him saying to me, Kez, you need to respect your doctor. You need to respect the nurses. You need to respect your manager. So for me, them values have lied with me within, within myself. So I think, you know, the question that you ask is, Probably for some people, they will probably have to show that they are working twice as hard. But I think we absolutely need to be mindful of this point that diversity creates um, innovation. Diversity brings in hardworking individuals. Diversity brings in intrinsic knowledge that individuals bring from their diverse backgrounds. So for me, what I'm trying to say, I suppose, is as a South Asian Pakistani man, my values, my beliefs, my spiritual and religious belief and guidance allows me to give my best at my work. And that is something that I hold on to, um, you know, and I think as individuals, we have a role to play in our workplaces, a very positive role to play, because we know that the inequalities when we talk about BAME staff and their experiences are very different. So I think when there's people like myself and Yudi and my other colleagues on this call who are in influential senior roles and senior positions, we have a role to play in raising that, raising the bar on diversity and what diversity brings to our organisations. So your hard work comes naturally to you, is that what you're saying? I think there's something about being authentic. There's something about being the true you. There's something about your... Look, we come into organisations and we come to a set of values. We have our own personal values. And I think bringing them and having that interface creates, creates positive things in the workplace. Thank you very much for that. Um, I don't know if any of you wants to add anything to that. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I think I, I agree with Kez. I think for me, it's always been about my my work ethics and, and my work commitment. Yeah, uh, you know, fused with working in an in an environment, and it's about what you bring in 
Yeah, uh, you know, your values, your commitments and other people's values and commitments and how we share that, right? And how we embrace one another as well, right? Whilst working. Mm. And, and, and I think for me, you know, yeah, I've always gone the extra mile in terms of my work, yeah? Uh, yeah. Because I think working within NHS and social care settings, yeah, uh, you know, you, you have to always prove your worth, yeah? But uh, again, you know, that's validated by by different individuals and, and it brings brings about a person-centred, values-based approach as well, wh yeah. which I feel should be inclusive. But I think in, in terms of uh, looking at looking at how I've worked, right, across health and social care, there, there's there's been peaks and troughs with in terms of the messages that are coming out from NHS and, and, and social care uh, settings around workplace, uh, you know, strategies around working together, around embracing equality and diversity, understanding one another. It's about behaviours and cultures of the organisation and yeah. how we as, as individuals, right, work towards those behaviours and cultures in a very positive light. OK, thank you. OK, so shall I just chip in from uh, research? Uh, evidence point of view. Yes, please. So I, th I think I think my two colleagues, Kez and Said, have talked about their personal experience and the fact that their work ethic is driven by the values, by mm -hmm. the culture, by um, the creativity that diversity brings. But I want to address the fact that with research, there is evidence which shows that non-traditional staff people who are uh, not always in particular roles, um, I've had to prove themselves. Um, I, I have done quite a lot of work just looking at black staff, BME staff experiences of performance assessment. I kid you not, there are loads and loads of narratives that point to the fact that sometimes the standards that are used to assess people from different backgrounds are uh, somewhat different and therefore there is this um, the, the expectation that to be able to address these differential assessments that people do work doubly um, hard. Sometimes you, you hear expressions of colleagues actually saying, I did this, my colleague did this and I wasn't good enough and therefore I had to do this. I mean, just look at qualifications. Mm -hmm. we that black and minority ethnic people are overqualified for the jobs that they do. So yeah. see, that That's is the definition of really hard because people are not always sure of how to assess. Performance assessment is different. Thank you very much for that balance. Right, okay, so I could actually, um, Saeed, back to you. Um, just wanted to know if you have experienced banter in a workplace that isn't always culturally sensitive because culture means a lot to you. Yeah, I think for me, right, it's about noticing uh, things when I, I, I grew a beard and, and started wearing a skull cap, yeah, and, and, and people were kind of asking me about why, why has this change come about, yeah, uh, you know, asking me, uh, about you know uh, wh why I was kind of you know why I've changed my dress code you know what's brought about this change etc. But for me you know uh, as as a Muslim yeah <clears throat> I I had a I had a, a real extra leap of faith in terms of my own religious convictions yeah and I think you know for me it's about myself it's about my own identity and people have asked about you know. My, my religious convictions and what, what are the rules and conditions of my religion and I think for me my identity has changed and therefore it's allowed me to actually share right a lot about myself my culture my religion yeah because other people right you know all of a sudden right have noticed this change yeah so yeah. But for me yeah I, I've, I've noticed right one of the things that I was leading on uh, you know I was head of equality yeah and uh, I had uh, citywide partners that were based in the other primary care trust, and they always used to say, right, that you know we we're, we're seen as the thought police. So every time we enter a room, people would be quiet. Yeah, people won't use any banter because 
uh, you know, they, they, they thought that we would use that against them, etc. So people were very consciously aware of our roles. But for me, you know, the, the change happened where I physically changed, the, uh, you know, my level of commitment changed. But I was the same old Saeed, yeah. committed to the cause. But I noticed that people were using microaggressions, yeah, you know, asking yeah. me particular questions. But that wasn't conscious. I, you know, I, I felt like people were asking genuine questions to understand me and, you know, where I, where I stand. Yeah. Thank you very much. Does anyone want to uh, chip into that? I'd, I'd like to come in, um, Delphine, if, if I may. Um, and the reason why I want to come in is I feel over my um, working life, um, I, I've, I've sort of, for some reason, become this custodian um, of dignity, respect related practices within my previous organisation. We, I did hell of a lot of work around dignity and respect in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So I've come into the NHS, you know, I still consider myself as a fairly newcomer, although I've worked in the ambulance service for five years and just under five months within an acute setting. And my experience from HEI and, and local government coming into the NHS, I am finding that some of the microaggressions, unprofessional behaviour in the workplace seems to be there and always gets deemed as, oh, do you know what, it's a bit of laugh, it's a bit of banter. Mm. Well, actually, it's not a bit of a laugh. No. It's a bit of banter. Banter right. has to be consensual. Banter is not when you are picking on somebody because they are black or that they may be lesbian or they are disabled or they have any other protected group. Mm. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is we have key role, key work to do in this area. And for me, it's... It's about really focusing on this whole notion of inclusion. Because when you've got banter and not banter, when you've got harassment in the workplace, because the Equality Act defines such behaviour as either bullying or harassment. Mm -hmm. And in my working life, I have dealt with lots of individuals and I've seen the impact on them, not more as though for me, but my peers, my colleagues, I've seen the impact of microaggressions on them. Okay. And I think we as organisations have work to do in really focusing on nipping things in the bud, okay. looking at things that are really informal conflict resolution. And I think we need to get to that point where people are comfortable in doing that as well. Yeah, I mean, I can just come in there and I, I I agree with what my other colleagues have spoken about, but I think we have to look at it from this point of view. Um, I think banter, the thing called banter for me is about dehumanising people. It's about um, infantilising people. Uh, I I have experience and I, I, have, I have talked about this to a few people where you turn up to an activity, everybody else is described as being excellent, but because you are so conscious of the colours and the classy dressing, all people talk about is, oh my God, she's so colourful and she brings colour into the room. Now, I'm really sorry, that's not why I'm there. I'm there because I'm an excellent contributor to what's happening at that point. And that can be very, very demoralising. So whilst I agree that we have to have joy in our workplaces, but I don't think banter is the way to go because what it does is it actually demoralizes people. Yeah. yeah. And it leaves people feeling less of a human than the other people around them. Mm -hmm. And my sad observation is that banter is never devoid of the uh, identities that we bring into and that's the thing that actually makes us significant in any interaction and then if people pick on that by way of banter then what you've done is you've reduced that individual to um, a non-human 
Uh, and then that has implications for how they contribute to what's happening around them. It has implications for what happens after. It has implications for their their humanity. So I I, I, don't, I, I just think that colleagues have got to be just watchful and just not reduce people. You're listening to Can You Hear Me? The West Yorkshire and Harrogate Health and Care Partnership BAME Network Podcast. I'm going to pass this question on to Udi. How has the NHS changed culture, behaviour and rhetoric? towards BAME staff and what more needs to be done? Right, okay, so so let, let me let me look at this from um, not just the strategic, but let me bring evidence base into it. So we have evidence of um, NHS um, sometimes being very overt in the way the structures undermine uh, the contributions of BME colleagues. So I, I have a, a, a real analysis that has gone on from the work of um, earlier researchers about experiences of, of um, not just racism, but the generic discrimination and other things for BAME staff from 30 odd years ago. In that time, there has been some overt things that we disagree with. We've seen issues of disciplinaries where if you look like me, look like Kez and Saeed, you are twice as likely or more, depending on which trust you work with, with them, you're twice as likely to be disciplined. And I did talk about earlier about the differential performance assessment for people. There is a, a, a concept which goes like this. If I know you, and I, I feel like I can identify with you and usually based on who looks like who, then I can slap you at the wrist if you were to make a mistake. But if I don't look like you, I'm so afraid that uh, I could be called racist and therefore what I do is I go straight into rule books. And I use rule books as a way of interaction. So that, that if you think about who looks like who, we've got a period in the NHS up till this period where we're not reflecting the work, the senior leaders are not reflecting the workforce. And what that means is that the overuse of rule book will always be there and disadvantage people um, who look like me. But I guess I want to paint a more positive picture. So I've started with the history, which shows discrimination continues. And we have a lot of evidence which shows that from Klein's work to Anis Ishmael's work to the work um, uh, Likupe and myself have done about racism and uh, nurses from Sub-Saharan. You've got a wealth of information that gives you that continuation in discrimination. But the good news, though, is that I think there has there, there is increasing acceptance. So we're moving from the denial where people are saying, no, that can't be the case, to a point now where we've seen in Simon Stevens actually saying there is a problem. What do we do to resolve the problem? Thank you. So for me, there has been that change mm. to having rest, work, workforce, uh, race equality standards, mm. actually holding people to account. But what I want to say is that I have this school of thought that the accountability and how we manage it has got to be more transparent to the extent mm. that we have explicit picture of people who get because they have not done the right things. And I'm talking about leaders. Yeah. That accountability and the penalty that we put to issues that continue to blight uh, BAME staff in the NHS has got to be the way forward. If somebody had any uh, impropriety to do with finances, know what will happen. And mm. people know that, that or those individuals who are leading in that way will automatically be punished. And I'm using that uh, carefully. 
But I think the issues of um, discrimination, the issues of non-progression of people from uh, black and minority ethnic uh, backgrounds has got to have a level of accountability that is explicit, that we can actually see. That if you get it wrong, you are going to be uh, called to defend that situation and you could you could lose your job if you are to be raised. Thank you so much. I mean, you, you talked about using the rule book. So it's like rule book is used when it suits and all written rule used when it suits. Um, so does anybody have anything to contribute to that? Any of you guys yeah, comments? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, yeah. I, th I think I think what Odex mentioned. You know, for me, th there's two P's here, right? You know, one is one is process, and the other one is people. Yeah, and I think we need to value people because sometimes you're absolutely right. The rule book, right, is reached upon by by particular managers when when things go wrong, and rather than talking through things in an informal way yeah, may solve a problem. So I think we have to look at solutions-based approach to valuing people, but also if there's any microaggressions or any aspects of discrimination, right, that, that it, it's talked about in a very open way, but also taking into consideration the individual. And I think the, the report that Roger Klein wrote six years ago about snowy white pizza uh, has set a trend in terms of looking at, you know, the system and institutions and leadership. And I think th this is where good leaders uh, with good messages will have a, a very good organisation that adheres to a value and cultural perspective in terms of behaviours. Uh, and I hark back to one of the primary care trusts that I work with where uh, I, I had the 0.1% of chief executives from from the, the Bami communities and and I felt that this lady's leadership was absolutely exceptional. There was zero tolerance uh, towards any aspects of prejudice and, and discrimination, yeah, but also that I myself felt really comfortable about the messages that, that were going out from the leadership all the way down to frontline staff, yeah, and, and we, we had various kind of... Uh, working groups under the Improving Lives program, disability networks, race equality networks, yeah. And and because of, of good leadership, yeah, you know, and, and a good culture within the organization, people felt really comfortable, right? And you could see that by people not leaving the organization, but people actually enjoying the work. Uh, we had a staff survey where 95% of staff actually responded to a staff survey about the culture and behavior in the organization. This mm. is absolutely phenomenal, whereby nowadays you would get a peak of 25 to 35% of respondents. Yeah? And, and we within our organization have had a cultural collaborative uh, that's been led by the chief executive about looking at culture and behavior within the organization. So, so there is work there, right? But, but, but for me, I think what we need to do is we need to look at solution, solutions based. Yeah perspective you know and what i call root to the fruit you know kind okay. of process thank you so much i mean roger klein has done quite a great work you know in bringing some of these issues to light and uh, and i think he's a great ally um i just very quickly want to say one or okay. two things uh, first of all i agree with both of my colleagues in in, in what they are saying mm -hmm. so from my perspective I think if we can just be have a little moment around COVID-19, what COVID-19 has told us, you know, one of the first things is around the disproportionate impact on black and Asian communities that COVID-19 has 19, um, displayed. The impact of all of that has been absolutely significant. I feel the NHS obviously very evidence-based. Judy touched upon the point around the workforce race equality standards. Yeah. If that's not our evidence that indicates, because it is evidence, it indicates that we do have inequalities in the wider NHS. We know that we've got the evidence around that. I think in the direction that we are traveling in, so, you know, some of the work that's developing around the integrated care systems and the whole notion on BAME leadership, belonging, you know, the chief people officer has recently launched the NHS people plan. And I'm really, really pleased that belonging is quite high on the agenda within that plan. And I think 
these things can only put us in the right direction. But again, I think all of these issues are in the limelight. I think leaders are now in a position where they can no longer be in denial. You know, the whole focus has to be on that real change and accountability. You're listening to Can You Hear Me? The West Yorkshire and Harrogate Health and Care Partnership BAME Network podcast. So, my next question goes to Kez. Do you find there are equal opportunities to tap into unfulfilled potentials? Interesting question. Um, I think there's, yes, absolutely. You know, when we talk about the whole notion of equal opportunities and as organisations, we we often say, yeah, we are um, we are committed to equal opportunity, equality of opportunity. So what does that really, really mean? Um, and I think organisations really need to grasp that and understand that, in my opinion. So if somebody who has potential who has talent you know um how do you identify that in an equality of opportunity world and i think for me it's about getting the approach right in the first instance thank you do we agree (laughs) any comment on that yeah i think i think for me it's it's got to be uh, a different way of thinking about how the embodiment of talents because I think we have been in a world where t- talents are assumed to look a certain way and it's embodied in a particular, not just ethnicity, but categories. And the difficulty with that approach is you then go for recruiting yourself, go for promoting yourself because you are the norm. And we've had this a long time. So my advice would be that our HR colleagues and people who are involved in talent spotting and talent um, development and so on have got to think differently about what leadership is and to accept that the embodiment of leadership does not just look the way it has always looked. So we've got a world now where we've got... um, many kinds of approaches that come in to support the way we do things. I was just listening to a colleague using Ubuntu as a basis for leadership because Ubuntu has got very strong principles coming back from, coming out of Africa, which says we are because I am. And therefore that principle of leadership has got to also be seen. So some of the work that we're doing at the university at the moment is looking at different knowledges and how different knowledges support leadership and supports the way we bring ourselves to work and the acknowledgement of that. So if we're talking equal opportunities, we have to start looking at different ways of identifying identifying success, identifying uh, contributions, different ways of how uh, talents embodied differently contribute to the growth of our organization rather than being stuck in the mindset that merit is what drives things. The question is, what do you do before you see merit? Because I can be as meritorious as I I want to. If your mindset is that merit is embodied in a white male body of a particular age, no matter how hard I'm trying, you may not necessarily see that talent. So it's about how we use new lenses to look at merit and define talent that would help us in uh, fulfilling those potentials. Yeah, I I, I think for me, it's it's a whole systems approach to to looking at talent. So when we uh, recruit somebody, uh, once they're recruited, how they have opportunities for for further learning and development, uh, how we acknowledge and validate that they've got skills and experiences above and beyond the job description, yeah? Uh, and also, in, in terms of, if you look at the, the BAMI staff net, networks, right, the rent networks in particular, yeah, organisations may want to use people's skills and experience to do particular pieces of work, and, and that's recognised, but it's also recognised through 
personal development reviews and personal development plans, yeah? So it, it's discussed, it's negotiated, and that's how you, you build and keep individuals within your organisation, that you acknowledge them, you value them, there's a fair and equitable process for them to develop within the organisation. So I think that there's a lot more than just looking at the equal opportunities lens. It's looking at different lenses at different times, yeah? And it's about how individuals progress uh, within their own work and feel comfortable that they are supported uh, and, and they're allowed to, to learn and develop within the organisation. Thank you. I think uh, Udi mentioned something about the HR having to support and same with say is, you know, saying that, you know, that individuals need to be supported. And what I'm hearing from my own zone here is that when you are seen to be ambitious and wanting to develop yourself, then you get all this discrimination and disciplinary and things like that. So I would want to ask Udi, you know, would it be helpful to have BIM HR, especially for disciplinary and grievance meetings within the workforce to actually understand, you know, exactly where, you know, the sorts of issues Okay, so that 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 is um, an interesting one for me, because I believe very strongly that uh, a more mainstream approach to tackling issues is what would save us well in the long run. But there's nothing wrong in the first place um, asking um, an HR person who's responsible for uh, disciplinaries and grievances to to take a, a more specific look at issues of disproportionality based on on people from black asian minority ethnic i will be very disappointed if we went down the route of just having a special person to look for BAME because then we will be pushed to have a special person to look at disciplinary disciplinaries linked to disability and so on so my humble advice would be let's go back to the root cause mm. what is the problem here that's right. The problem here is that we have uh, systemic structural inequalities that creates particular disproportionality. And therefore, in fixing that particular disproportionality, we need to go back to the root analysis. And HR has got to have this take on looking at the whole uh, side said something about a whole systems approach, but within that there could be uh, some zooming into specifics rather than having uh, this add on. So let's just get a BAME HR person who deals with no, let's try and make sure that we go with the principles of does our HR team reflect our, our world? As in, do we have a balance, gender equality balance? Do we have um, ethnicity balance? Do they reflect the patient group that we serve and all that? And once we have that, let, let's then start looking at issues of cultural competence in the NHS workforce or the HR workforce rather than creating little pockets. Even if we did, it has to be a very short term where... Measure. Yeah, getting into what the problem is, but we must stand it down quickly so we can have a mainstream approach that talks to the different agenda. What I don't want is for us to create a specific identity-based role within disciplinary that then brings in people and we, we lose them as we go on because I've seen a lot of that happening where we're creating specific specialist role for particular groups and within a year, because it's a short-term thing, those individuals lose the job. So I believe that we need to have more mainstreamed approach to managing these issues. So we now know, and we've always known, that we're not managing disciplinaries and grievances fairly. So what do we do structurally to ensure that we address that rather than putting in short-term things that we're not able to sustain over time? That would be my humble advice. That's amazing. Thank you. So this brings us to our final question. And Sorry, uh, 
Sorry, sorry. I, I just wanted to come in there with a final comment on the last question. Okay, I, sorry. I agree with everything um, you've said, Yude. I think absolutely it goes back to the root analysis. And from my experience, um, a lot of the HR departments that I've worked in or worked for have not been reflective of the wider workforce. Mm. And when we look, when we talk about grievances and disciplinaries, and when we look at our res data, we know there is a significant inequality there. Um, some of Yudi's initial, you know, research that she did highlighted that as well. That still lies as a problem. So I think it's absolutely important that our HR teams are diverse teams who have a wider understanding of why that individual is now all of the sudden in trouble for something that they have done. I think that diversity in itself explores or allows you to look at the root of that issue and the root of that problem. But just to finish off, I think rather than having individual HR professionals, you know, there's lots of work going on around networks and ensuring that networks have a voice. So why can't we, as part of the wider system, develop a forum where grievances, disciplinary, certainly where they have a race element in them, they can come to an independent, <clears throat> losing my voice now, <clears throat> it's okay. um, they can come to an independent group who can provide a diversity lens to some of them grievances and to maybe make some suggestions and recommendations to whoever they need to make them recommendations to. Can I just come in, just, just a couple of points here. I, I think one in terms of after the Stephen Lawrence murder inquiry, and then obviously the amendment to the Racial Relations Act, I did a lot of work around looking at processes, structures, policies, in terms of looking at a race equality impact assessment. I think Kez is right in terms of looking far beyond this, yeah? But I think what we need to do also do is uh, reflect upon whether these practices and policies have gone through an equality impact assessment and, and get scrutiny, uh, you know, all around. We need that 360 degree vision to say that within this policy, does it discriminate against the protected characteristics? And if it does, then it's not fit for purpose. So therefore, you know, all organisations need an element of scrutiny. And can we use the BAMI networks to, to allow that level of scrutiny, yeah? But but I I, I do agree with uh, you know uh, uh, the professor in terms of uh, you know what what I don't want is a tick box to say we've got uh, a BAMI expert working within HR because that brings a lot of issues in terms of again support lack of support the workload increasing there may be many disciplinaries that this individual is given right because they'll be seen as a specialist. We've been there and we've worn the T-shirt, yeah? We need to make all of this mainstream so all of this lies at the heart of the organisation. And it's the organisation that's responsible for making sure that policies, practices and procedures are fit for purpose. Thank you. Scrutiny, root cause analysis, getting the diversity group to... This is, yeah, we're going somewhere with this. Right, so we go to our last question. Uh, and I think this goes to Saeed. Uh, does the BAME label help or hinder workplace diversity? Yeah, I think I think for me, right, it, it's, it's more than a label, yeah. You know, I see myself as an individual working in the organisation, yeah. Yes, people will sometimes come to me for advice around race, advice around religion etc yeah but because I've got a generic job yeah uh, for, for me it's about how I approach things it's about looking at bias and unconscious bias it's about spreading you know the message around I think as Kez uh, alluded to right at the beginning it's about diversity and it's about you know embracing one another and valuing one another right you know uh, as opposed to ha having a uh, a label we are labeled and and i think as as this interview has has gone on right we we've, we've realized that through research there is disproportionality there is racism there is labels put, uh, put upon individuals but when when you look at uh, for example the recent events as kez highlighted the covid uh, issue yes bami staff in terms of not having protective gear you know deaths within within uh, the bami staff 
that has actually now come to the forefront. So years and years and years of looking at inequalities in health, yeah, all of a sudden you've got data and statistics that are painting a very, very different picture. So yes, whilst people will label us, it's about what we do and how we interact. And, and it's about how we as, as BAMI staff or whatever you want to call yourself, how we work within the system to, to make the system a lot more fair uh, and talk about inequities, talk about inequalities, and try to put a solution to the problem to look at a fair and just society and a fair and just workplace. Thank you. Kez, are you, are you looking to come in or? Yeah, just 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 very quickly then. I agree again with 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 with, with what Saheed absolutely has said. I think we are all unique individual people at the end of the day and we all have something magnificent to bring uh, in whatever that magnificence is but i think when we talk about BAME and we talk about you know these acronyms as lgbt and you know we we develop all these acronyms and names etc i think we really need to be mindful on the whole notion of inclusion and if we were truly inclusive organizations then we would not have such terms where that where we would be dividing people and etc and i think you know because of the inequality within the systems i see why we've got such you know titles i think again i think it's a little bit to what saheed said if our approach is right to diversity and inclusion in our organizations so if there was a bame network for example which at the moment there's lots of talk and lots of development on bame networks how are we bringing in our white allies and our white colleagues um, to them to that BAME agenda? So that all of the sudden it's not the BAME agenda. It's not Yudi's agenda or Saheed's or Kez's agenda. This is about a collective call for action. Yeah. Um, so that's what I just wanted to um, highlight there. Thank you. That's great. Thank so you. If, yeah, so if I may come in. Um, yeah. I, I think there is a pragmatic thing here, and if you look at some of the discourses that is going on uh, around the homo homogenization of groups. Um, so I'm going to come at it from two points. So on one side of the coin, I think our identities are not necessarily presented in this way. So I'm a, an African uh, woman, a uh, Nigerian for that matter. And I come at it from that, if you really want to look at my peculiarities, which will be different from cases when it comes to a matter of how I am presented with many choices in, in the hospital. So it's the understanding that my specific identity would mean that my requirements would be different to cares. So the health professional needs to understand that you cannot homogenize and bring a group of people together to the point where we're losing it. So on that basis, our individual identities are very, very important. So the BAME level should not give us the reason or the excuse to have, have a group of people from many, many backgrounds being pulled together and then we homogenize our delivery. So that's that on that side. But you flip it to the other side is about, uh, Kes has touched on this, that because we are, as humans, we are lazy and therefore we are going to try and group people together so it makes it easy for us to present things and so on. So for policy and for being able to categorize the data in a way that is easier, I don't see a problem in having data separately as well as grouping together, as long as we can go into the lived experience knowing that not all members of Black, Asian, minority, ethnic, and within that you're talking about um, people from the traveling uh, community, you're talking about that they will not be needing things the same way because they are different So, in terms of specific identity. So mm -hmm. my advice would be that people who are looking at designing things, uh, looking at delivering things, have got to come at it not from a homogenizing, so BAME people, and therefore we all present all of them with this thing, 
in this way. For me, that's laziness. We need mm. to go down into the personalized approach, individualistic approach, where we understand that whilst uh, people from this group may do things in this way, I cannot generalize that to everybody that comes under the umbrella of BAME. In my data analysis, I'm even suggesting to colleagues now that when you do an analysis of attainment, for example, how uh, different students attain so that you can make a judgment on the attainment gaps, you need to even drill down and find out because black students are worse off when it comes to the attainment and the experiences as compared to Chinese students, as compared to this. So it's about having that level of intelligence where we use BAME pragmatically rather than using it as excuse for not delivering at the level of need. You've been listening to the West Yorkshire and Harrogate Health and Care Partnership BAME Network podcast. Thanks to Delphine Arinze, Udi Achibong, Kez Hayat and Syed Ahmed. And thank you for listening. Join us again next time when we'll be joined by more diverse talent working to improve health and care for people in West Yorkshire and Harrogate.